worship. So, got a question for you. And you don't have to answer it out loud because I'm going to see if I can help you with this question. And so, the question is, what is worship? Don't answer me. Just think about it. What is worship? Now, how many people heard my directions? How many people... Pastor, I'm starting to wonder if people be listening to you when you're standing up here. First thing I said is don't answer out loud. Singing and praising. That's the first thing I said. Don't answer out loud. Because I want you to think about it. People, you know, the lip. You know, the, the tongue thing. This is where I want it. Okay? Because God doesn't honor what you say with your mouth. He honors how you live. I'm sorry, I put my mic down. From your heart. And so I just want you to answer that because I'm trying to get you into the heart of worship and if we're only here to talk and look and observe then we're going to miss God when he comes into our presence because worship is truly about inviting God into our presence so while you're thinking about in your heart what worship is I'm going to tell you what it isn't okay worship isn't coming in and sitting in the same seat all the time I mean you can do that but really it's about coming in and fellowshipping it's about greeting and meeting and encouraging one another that's one of the reasons why I like to worship because I like to be in the presence of God's people Amen. worship isn't giving although you do give but it's not because somebody told you to, or because of a routine. Worship is giving from the heart because of your love for the Lord, okay? Worship isn't about singing, although we do sing, okay? It's more about lifting up our personal experiences in honor of who God is in our lives. And so who needs music when you have the heart of worship? We can invite him in our presence and not play a single instrument. Why? Because we love the Lord that much. And as you stand to your feet, we're going to invite his presence on us today. Why? Because we love God. And so we're going to start with a hymn, just a little chorus that's not on the screen. But if you love God, and even if you don't, you're able to sing this song because you simply sing in preparation for worship, my brothers and sisters. Oh, how I love Jesus. 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 Because he first loved me. And it's in the light of that love we sing our opening selection today. Because I'm so glad Jesus lifted me. Amen. How about you? Amen. Yeah. Amen. Praise God. I'm so glad Jesus lifted me. I'm so glad Jesus lifted me. Come on, worship with me, church. I'm so glad Jesus lifted me. Singing glory, hallelujah. Jesus lifted me. Yes, I was lost in sin. Jesus rescued me. I was lost in sin. Jesus rescued me. I was lost in sin. Jesus rescued me. Singing glory, hallelujah. Jesus lifted me. And now I'm heaven bound. Jesus set me free. Now I'm heaven bound. Jesus set me free. Now I'm heaven bound. Jesus set me free. Singing glory, hallelujah. Jesus set me free. Oh, I'm so glad. Jesus lifted me, I'm so glad, Jesus lifted me, I'm so glad, Jesus lifted me, singing glory, hallelujah, 
Jesus set me free. Amen. Hallelujah. Yes. So glad. Amen. Good morning, church. Good morning. God is good all the time. Amen, amen. Welcome everyone and uh, especially uh, warm welcome for those of you who might be with us for the first time. Uh, what a, a joy it is for me sometimes just to be able to uh, get out to the front porch and, and welcome some folks that have come for the first time and uh, we're, uh, we're grateful for you. You know, this time of year, especially for those who are coming into First Baptist for the first time. One of the things that you notice is that this is a, a congregation that loves to travel for the summer, even with the gas prices that we have. And so um, uh, Steve and, and Margie will still be out probably a couple more weeks. It was great to have Rosie in. But one of the cool things when we're kind of, you know, forced into a box, uh, it sometimes makes people uncomfortable is singing Acapoco. I mean, acapella. <laughs> I got vacation on my mind. <laughs> but it, is it really helps us to focus on and concentrate on the lyrics? And the other thing is, is churches can't figure out the difference between a contemporary song and a traditional hymn. It's just all worship. So, uh, so we're often tested. How about that? That sounds like a biblical concept. We're often tested outside of our comfort zone. And I just want to encourage you to ease right into the comfort of worshiping the Lord. And uh, let, let's uh, let it all out on him. And one of the things is, is uh, Yvette was uh, quizzing you. Worship is just telling God how much you love him. Amen. That's really, you know, love him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. So that's all we need to do is just be reminded of all that he gave to us. Remember that it was all that he had, and that's what we give to him. Well, if you're a guest of ours today, uh, help us to be able to connect with you. Perhaps you've got some questions. Maybe you're looking for a church home. You just want some uh, want to know more about what God is doing here. Take the first step, please, of the connection card. It's in the pocket of the seat in front of you. Take some time during the worship. Fill out at least, you know, whatever you feel comfortable, but hopefully there's some means of communication, especially if we are to be able to respond to you in any way. At the end of the service, take the connection card to the connection center. That makes sense, right? That's the counter on the left, the opposite side of the coffee and goodies, and uh, hand that to the person with a smiling face because we have a gift to tell you how much we appreciate you. There's not a whole lot that I'm going to share with you today, but let's get down to some of the essentials. The insert in your bulletin, your listening guide. We're still in Mark chapter 13 in our sermon series. It's all about Jesus. Notice that it's uh, be on your guard. Well, that sounds like last week, doesn't it? Well, I'm going to keep preaching it till you get it right. No, I'm just saying. No, today, today is part two. There was so much packed into last week. Uh, I had to do a part two. And if you missed last week, just uh, join us on our YouTube channel. And, uh, and part one is there. Find chapter 13 in Mark's gospel. Uh, bookmark it. We'll get back to that a little bit uh, later on. A couple other things that I'll share. Um, at the end of the service, but first I want to say to those of you who came out to Uplift on Sunday, it was, Wednesday. what did I say? You said Sunday. Sunday. I like Sunday, I get it. Thank you. I'm sure you'll be correcting me during my sermon too. Who knows what I'm going to say, right? But Wednesday, you know, uh, it, it, typical Baptist, y'all didn't show up till like one minute till. But man, I'm telling you, what a beautiful sight, you know, and we just had a blast. And as always, your testimonies were just absolutely gorgeous. And, uh, and I'm, I'm grateful uh, for you. Um, tomorrow, we're going to go back to prayer in our, our circle here. Today, immediately after the worship service is a short 
business meeting, our quarterly business meeting. It's halfway through 22 already, and uh, we want to welcome a, a new member into uh, the church family. So if you would hang out for that just a little bit, uh, I, I would appreciate so we can get that business taken care of. And uh, it's a little bit ways out, but mark on your calendar our five-day club. That's that's essentially, if you've ever been familiar with VBS, Vacation Bible School, this is our version through uh, Child Evangelism Fellowship. It's uh, July 18 to 22. Put that on your prayer. If you want to participate and help out in any way, uh, see Terry or Joan and and. It, Plenty of advance because we take particular security and precautions when doing children's ministry. With that, let's, uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer, continue our time of uh, worship together, and um, uh, just start prepare our hearts, shall we? Would you join me? Heavenly Father, what a privilege, what an honor to be able to come into your presence here in your house here. Lord, uh, theologically, we know that you're with us always when we know you as Savior and Lord. The Holy Spirit is, is within us, indwelled in uh, this temple. But it is the ecclesia, the gathering together that makes this time so special. Lord, I know that people in everyday life go through an awful lot. Grief, sorrow, and pain. It sometimes comes emotionally and sometimes it comes uh, physically. Sometimes, Lord, it comes spiritually. And we feel the weight of the world on our shoulders. Lord, I also realize that sometimes we come seeking after you as the last resort rather than the first. And we say we're so grateful to be able to serve such a loving, gracious, and merciful God. And you accept us into your uh, presence. You invite us. You have actually been pursuing us for a love relationship. And as we began with the hard attitude today that we have come here to love you, I pray that if we do not know you, Lord, that we will seek after you. And your word teaches us and promises us if we seek after you, we will find you. That you're standing right there in front of us if we would just turn from our sin and turn to our salvation. Father, you invite us to come into your holy presence and to stand in awe of who you are. And I pray, Lord, that that's the, the hard attitude that we bring to you. We stand in awe because you are awesome, God. And so, Lord, here are our songs that we sing to please your heart. Songs with lyrics that praise and exalt you. Songs of thanksgiving. Hear our cries out to you. Lord, we love you. Thank you for first loving us. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. amen. So church family, as you imagine the introduction of the piano as I introduce this next selection, I want to simply share with you uh, that my uh, conscientiousness was heightened this week after the sermon, Be On Your Guard, part one last week, particularly when we look from the war in Ukraine to the wars in our nation, in the grocery stores, in the church sanctuaries, in the schools, on the streets. The evil is prevalent, and it's no surprise to anybody who knows the word of God because it's been foretold. And even in those circumstances, there is a sense of peace knowing that we indeed can be on guard when we lean on the power of our God. So as you stand to your feet, this next election reminds us that we have permission to lean on the everlasting arms of Jesus. Amen. What a fellowship. What a fellowship. What a joy divine. Leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness. What a peace in mind. 
leaning on the everlasting arms, leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms, leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, how sweet to walk in the pilgrim way, leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, how bright the path rose from day to day, leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms. Leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. What have I to dread? What have I to fear? Leaning on the everlasting arms. I have blessed peace with my Lord so near, leading on the everlasting arms. Yes, I'm leading, I'm leading, I'm safe and secure from all along. that we can lean on those everlasting arms. It's by faith. My faith looks up to thee, O oh, precious lamb of Calvary. My faith looks up to thee, the lamb of Calvary. Savior, Divine, now hear me while I pray, take all my guilt away, oh let me from this day be holy. Greece 
surround me, spread be thou my guide. fortunate and so blessed because our God is still the same. Hallelujah. Yes. Yesterday, Praise today, Praise and God. forevermore, yes. our God is still the same. Amen. And so with that promise, certainly you can have the confidence to stand on the promises Amen. of our King. Amen. Standing on the promises of Christ my King. Through eternal ages let his praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing. Standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing. Standing on the promises of God my Savior. Standing. Standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Church, yes, I am standing on the promises I now can see. Perfect present cleansing in the blood for me. Standing in the liberty where Christ makes free. Standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises of Christ, the Lord. Bound to him eternally by love's strong cord. Overcoming daily with the Spirit's sword. Yes, I'm standing on the promises of God. Will you stand with me, church? Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing. Standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Yes, we are standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing. Don't you just want to stay there? Standing, standing. I'm standing on the promises of God. Hallelujah. Yes. Standing on the promises we 
because he's able. Standing, standing, standing. Pray with me, church, please. Pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, so much for this opportunity today to be reminded of how we can be on our God. We are anticipate part two this week, Lord, of the message that you reminded us of last week. Because this isn't new. It's been in your word, and you're bringing it to our attention just so we can be on our guard. And so, Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to worship. We thank you for all of the elements of worship that you allow us to experience today, Father. And we just ask that you would continue to shape our hearts, continue to bless us in our time of worship, restore and refill and prepare us for another week's journey. We thank you, God, for our pastor. We especially thank you for your word because it is by the power of your word that we live and move and breathe and have our being in Christ. And so we thank you, God, for your son. We thank you for the life that you've given us through the sacrifice of his life that our punishment of sin has been uh, secured in the finished work of Christ. And now, Lord, we just ask you to help us to be all that you say we are. Help us to be more than conquerors, Lord. Help us to be children of God. Help us to be high priests. Help us to be witnesses before this world. Let our light so shine before men as we be on our guard for you that your name continues to receive the glory, the honor, and the praise out of our lives. Thank you, God, that you are still the same, and you are still God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. One of the strangest paradoxes in our culture is that though none of us want to die, many of us have a longing to see the end of the world. Amen. You know, it shows up in the apocalyptic uh, movies that, that we watch and we love, the movies that they envision a hopeless future or an end to the world. Do you ever see or uh, watch uh, Mel Gibson in Mad Max, or Arnold Schwarzenegger in The Terminator, or how about Bruce Willis in Armageddon? Yeah, uh, yeah. Not to forget Kirk Cameron in Left Behind. Right. What explains our draw towards apocalyptic films and, and Bible studies? I mean, people just love to hear the story of Revelation. Right? Why, why do they seem to resonate so much with us? Could it be because, well, we know that this world isn't getting any better? It's, it's only getting worse. And we intuitively know that something is fundamentally and, and irreparably wrong with our world. That we recognize a brokenness and an evil in this world that we cannot overcome without Jesus. And yet we long for that new and better kind of world. Well, this, this morning we're going to continue with part two. In reality, it isn't the same message as last week. So you can be relieved at that. But part two, be on your guard. Mark chapter 13 in our series, it's all about Jesus. And as a review of the first uh, 13 verses, how about if we just read them again together as we did last week. But I will say that we, our attention will be focused on verses 14 to 23, the abomination of desolation. <clears throat> 
So with your Bibles open to Mark chapter 13, beginning in verse 1, I invite you, as I always do, if you're able, would you stand with me to honor the reading of God's Word? And again, because it's a little bit of a lengthier uh, passage, uh, 24 verses, if you cannot stand, don't worry about it. Beginning verse 1. And as he came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what wonderful sto stones and what wonderful buildings. And Jesus said to him, And do you see these great buildings? There will be not there will not be left one here. Hmm. The ESV has got an interesting uh, word. Uh, uh, there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. And as he uh, sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him privately, tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign when all these things are about to be accomplished? And Jesus began to say to them, see that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name saying, I am he, and they will lead many astray. And when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and the kingdom against kingdom. And there will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. These are but the beginning of birth pains. But be on your guard. For they will deliver you over to the councils. And you will be beaten in the synagogues. And you will stand before governors and kings. And for my sake to bear witness before them. And the gospel must first be proclaimed to all nations. And when they bring you to trial and deliver you over, do not be anxious beforehand what you are to say, but say whatever is given you in that hour. For it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. And brother will deliver brother over to death. And the father, his child, and children will rise against parents and have them put to death. And you will be hated for all my, uh, hated by all for my name's sake. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. Beginning at verse 14 now. But when you see the abomination of desolation standing where he ought not to be, let the reader understand then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let the, the one who is on the housetop not go down nor enter his house to take anything out. And let the one who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak. And alas, for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days, pray that it may not happen in winter. For in those days there will be such tribulation as has not been from the beginning of the creation that God created until now and never will be. And if the Lord had not cut short the days, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect whom he chose, he shortened the days. And then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ. Or look, there he is. Do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform signs and wonders to lead astray, if possible, the elect. But be on guard. I have told you all things beforehand. Let us pray. Father, this is not necessarily a, a message that uh, our Lord and Savior has delivered to us just to fill up our hearts with uh, warm and fuzzy happiness and joy, but it is more serious than most things that he taught. But Lord, I pray that again, as serious as we are about our relationship with you, we ask that by the work of your spirit, open up our faculties 
Let us hear with our ears and with our hearts. May we see with our eyes, but see also with the eyes of our heart. May we come to understand, Lord, what you are trying to convey to us. And I pray above all, Lord, we are radically changed by it. Be honored and glorified in the message that you have delivered here today. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Thank you, church. Please be seated. Quite clearly, the, the events in Mark's chapters 11 through 12 and Jesus' confrontation with the religious leaders there in the temple laid the foundation of Jesus' teaching uh, right here in chapter 13. The religious system in Israel was corrupt to the core. I mean, bad to the bone. And the disciples should expect the, the, that the corruption to result in these catastrophic events that are revealed here in chapter 13. Those events will be capped by the coming of the sun uh, in the clouds. That's uh, next week's message, so stay tuned for that. But who will, he will come to put all things right, so the disciples need to be on guard. And when Jesus' disciples asked him, well, what will be the sign when all these things are about to be accomplished? He told them that the signs of the wars and the, the natural calamities would not be the end, but are simply the events that they must endure before the end comes. Now, that surely would have been a disappointing answer to those apocalyptic movie buffs, wouldn't it? But as a result of our sin... Our world is growing darker and more wicked every day. It is a wonder that people just cannot realize how dangerous our sin's effect is on our world the way that it is. But to do that, for one, to actually acknowledge just how dangerous it is, they would also have to acknowledge that there is a God that mankind has rebelled against. Mark 13 is not about signs and timetables. It's about discernment. Not being fooled by the people with timetables and signs. It's about allegiance to Jesus. And as we look at the abomination of desolation today, may you, you, you may remember, as I said last week, that some scholars see this passage of Scripture strictly apocalyptic. Although Jesus has just got done prophesying the temple's destruction of A.D. 70, nevertheless, the abomination is a continuance of that message, not yet a, a shifting to a different subject. Now, in the following section about Jesus coming back and again in the clouds, there is no mistake about what he's talking about there. And we'll address that next week. But here, folks, I want us to see that Jesus is talking about the, the destruction of the temple in A.D. 70 because historical evidence backs up that what he says, and if a temp, another temple is built in Jerusalem, as many people believe there will, that then this prophecy would also apply to the end times, all right? So it's not one or the other, but, but perhaps both. So why should we see this passage that way? Simply this. We will see how Jesus' warning of the temple's destruction was for the safety and for the protection of believers when that horrible tragedy actually came about just as he said that it would. It serves as a warning for believers then and today when they witness the signs that the end is coming. 
I mean, those who did, listen, those who didn't pay any attention to Jesus when he revealed himself and his, his identity as the Son of God perished at the hands of the Roman siege and destruction. And likewise, they perished without any faith in Jesus for all eternity in a very special place that was reserved for Satan and those who reject Jesus. And the same will be true when the world comes to an end. No one, folks, no one stressed the urgency of sharing the gospel to the lost more than Jesus. This is one major takeaway we have to put in our pockets and leave with today that Jesus wants us all to get. He wants us to understand, to get out of Scripture, if nothing else. Jesus cares deeply for each and every one of us. You here with me today, you out there in YouTube land, he cares deeply for us. In fact, you may remember in Scripture how he wept as he looked over a lost city of thousands upon thousands who will perish without repentance of sin, his forgiveness, and receive the gift of salvation. It broke his heart. Folks, before we get into the next part of Jesus' teaching, I really need to stop right here and, and, and ask you for your attention. Do I have your attention? Yes. All right. In case you have never heard this before, in case you've never understood this before today, and there are some who claim to be born-again Christians raised in the church, and yet they have no understanding of this biblical truth that I'm about to tell you. But listen, folks. One must be saved before they die if they have any hope of spending eternity with Jesus in heaven. Do you know when you're going to die? I don't. Some folks who are terminally ill are actually blessed by God's grace to, to, to be able to prepare for their death. But most of us don't know when that's going to happen. So we must be prepared. Am I right? When is the best time to be prepared? <laughs> like how about today, right? Would you agree with me that dying is not reserved only for the old? Yes. Now, if you love to ride motorcycles like Judy and I do, we understand that death could come any day. Young people all over this nation are murdered by evil scumbags every single day. People who didn't plan on dying when they woke up that morning. You get my point? Yes. Praying for the dead is not biblical. Yes. Death is too late for salvation. When Jesus said, and the gospel must be first proclaimed to all nations, it was in the context of his imminent return, but the urgency in proclaiming the gospel is so our lost loved ones will be saved by Jesus. Amen. Now, those who believe prayer is effective to save their dead loved ones are either victims of their own false opinions or false teaching. It is heresy. There would be no urgency whatsoever to lead people to faith in Jesus if we could pray our dead, lost loved ones into heaven after, you know, they've lived a life of rejecting Jesus. There, there would be no reason for Jesus to suffer and die on a cross for our sin if salvation is possible for the unsaved in death, having rejected Jesus their entire life. 
God gives us much, much power in prayer, so we must be in prayer for our lost loved ones who are still alive. And there's great urgency to do that. But our prayers have no bearing on someone once he or she has died. That the reality is at this point of death, by the choice of the one who was, uh, by the choice made by the one who is deceased, one's eternal destiny is confirmed. Amen. Either one is saved through faith in Jesus Christ and is in heaven where they experience all the, the rest and joy that is in God's presence or they exist eternally in the torment of hell. So if you claim to have read all of the scriptures and you never read this truth, Friends, please don't take my word only, but for starters, why not pick up the Bible, go to the story of the rich man and Lazarus the beggar, Luke chapter 16, 19, and start there. Now you may ask then, why is Jesus teaching on both the temple that would be destroyed within the next 40 years of his teaching here, at the same time teaching the destruction of the world? Well, it's because Jesus could see them both. And he wants us to be prepared. He wants us to be prepared for death and eternity. Are you prepared? If you were to die this very day, which is a strong possibility, would you be prepared? Verse 14, when you see the abomination of desolation standing where he ought not to be, let the reader understand and then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Now, I said last week that an abomination is something that causes disgust or hatred. And desolation is a state of complete emptiness or destruction. The term originated with the prophet Daniel. The first fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy occurred in 167 BC before Christ by Antiochus Epiphanes, a Greek ruler who desecrated Jerusalem's temple by setting up an altar to the false god Zeus. And on that altar, he sacrificed a pig. And in using this term, abomination of desolation, Daniel was referring to someone who would take the beautiful worship of God and turn it horrid and disgusting so that people would run from the worship of God rather than being drawn to the worship of God. And as a result, the Jews abandoned the temple. The abomination of worship resulted in the desolation of worship for, by the Jews. They ran from God's house. They were no longer drawn to God's house. Jesus saw a second fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy, and, and there would be a second uh, desecration of that temple that would be so bad that it would cause the Jews to, to once again have to give up the worship of their temple and run from it. Now here's where I join a camp of respected theologians that differ with another camp of respected theologians. That is, that some Bible teachers see this prophecy we're talking about as only the final seven years of history and great tribulation. Now, perhaps that's because Jesus uses the word tribulation. Verse 19, again, for in those days there will be such tribulation as not been uh, from the beginning of creation that God created until now and never will be. But tribulation simply means grievous a trouble, a severe trial or 
Yes, suffering. Now, while I don't disagree that verse 19 probably does apply to the end times tribulation and the activity of the Antichrist. If one thinks these verses apply only to that, then it neglects the fact that it actually did happen just in Jerusalem the way that Jesus said that it would happen, and which is the primary focus of our text. Jesus had not changed subjects in talking to his disciples here. He's still answering the disciples' question about what sign they should look for to know the destruction of the temple is near. Now, folks, believe me, I'm not here solely to teach you a history lesson, though the Bible records true history. It's important that in teaching God's word that, that we stay true also to the context of what Jesus is teaching, which in this case became historical. At a time just before Jerusalem's destruction, the Jewish zealots took over temple worship. The zealots were the first century terrorists. They were so evil, they just knifed people in the crowds. And when this terrorist group took over the temple leadership, they installed a completely incompetent, unqualified high priest who directed a man named Phanius Ben Samuel, also known as Fanny. Essentially, he was a puppet on the strings of those who held the real power. We've seen that before in D.C., haven't we? And listen, this, the Jews called Fanny the clown because his leadership was a joke. And not only was Phanius not descended of high priests, but was such a clown that he scarcely even knew what the high priesthood meant. He came from a criminal background and therefore he turned the temple into a place of criminal activity and even having people murdered in the temple itself. Uh, that's quite an abomination of worship, wouldn't you say? Needless to say, it resulted in the desolation of worship by the people. Nobody wanted to be associated with an incompetent, unqualified high priest who was a criminal. And as and all throughout our sermon series in the Gospel of Mark, we have relied upon Matthew and, and Luke's Gospels to kind of fill in some of the puzzle pieces that Mark may not include. So let me go to Luke 21, 20 right now. And this is what Luke says about this same incident. But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies... Then know that its desolation has come near... Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains and let those who are inside the city depart. Let not those who are uh, out in the country enter in, meaning enter back into the temple. So Jesus said that when they see Jerusalem surrounded by an army, that was a sign that they were to get out of Dodge as fast as possible because God's judgment had come. Sure enough, the Roman army surrounded Jerusalem as a strategy to choke out the city of all their resources until they were completely weakened without food or water or any other necessities. Now, when the Roman army first surrounded Jerusalem, they gave a small window of time for folks to run from the city. Matthew, Mark, and Luke's Gospels had circulated throughout the Christian communities. Believers were, so they recognized the signs and, and they remembered what their Messiah's warning had, had been for them to flee to the mountains. The Romans let them go. They're the only ones who lived. Those who read God's word and believed 
were saved. Those who read God's word and believed were saved. Unbelieving Jews saw their magnificent temple as a fortified structure of refuge. So guess what they did? They ran to the temple and they held up there. And then the window of time closed quickly and the Romans cut the Jews off from from the outside world, making it impossible for anyone to escape. And as we continue in, in Mark, I want you to look how Jesus prophetically talked about this small window of time that Christians had once the Roman army arrived and the importance of taking advantage of it to escape God's judgment on Jerusalem. Verse 15, Jesus said, let the one who is on the housetop not go down nor enter the, his house to take anything out and let the one who is in the field not turn back to get his cloak. Jesus is saying, don't take any, don't, don't waste any time. Take no time to pack up. Just move now. Flee for your lives. And alas, for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days, pray that it may not happen in winter. Jesus said this would be especially hard for mothers with children. Oh, and they were to pray that God didn't bring his judgment in the winter, which would, of course, make running for their lives particularly hard. Rather strong language, don't you think? Yes. And it sounds more like the end of the world rather than a Roman siege upon Jerusalem. The fact that there will not be left one stone upon another that will not be thrown down, friends, was not the worst of it. Was not the worst of it. Josephus, uh, an ancient Jewish historian, wrote that Jerusalem had 1.2 million people in it when the Romans began the siege. During the siege, the Romans took 100,000 Jews, made them prisoners and slaves, and then they killed 1.1 million, either by starvation, by the sword, or by crucifixion. So many Jews were crucified, and this is recorded in history, that the hills were emptied of the trees that were used to build the crosses. They ran out of wood. Josephus described the city filled with starving mothers holding starving babies dying in their arms. In desperation, the mothers ate their own children. Some cooked and ate their own shoes. Some ate their own excrement. The streets were stacked with dead bodies of those who had starved to death. And when the Romans actually breached the walls, they killed so many Jews that the streets were flowing with blood. And notice how Josephus described the destruction of Jerusalem by the Romans in his book. It's titled Jewish Wars. I quote, Indeed, in my opinion, the misfortunes of all nations since the world began fall short of those of the Jews, end quote. His language similarly echoes Jesus' describing Jerusalem's destruction as being the worst act of brutality in world history. Remember Jesus again. For in those days there will be such tribulation as has not been from the beginning of the creation that God created until now and never will be. And if the Lord had not cut short the days, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect, I'm just going to say born again, those who believed, for the sake of the elect whom he chose, he shortened the days. 
in a time of great tragedy and despair and tribulations like the, the recent Texas school shootings and, and, and so many others that are going on around us, you're going to hear people say, well, where was God in the midst of this devastation? Uh, I don't see God when he's needed most. If God is really all about love and grace and mercy, he would have prevented this tragedy. Isn't that the broken record that we hear? And you're going to even hear people say, well, well, we can only pray about this situation. But those who say that are often, or too often, the voices who support prayer banned in school. Oh, we can pray, but we just can't pray in school. We can blame God, but let's kick him out of the school or wherever. The answer is the same as, as in Jesus's, or excuse me, in Jerusalem's destruction. God was on His throne the entire time and was in complete control of everything. Amen. His judgment was upon Jerusalem for rejecting our Savior Jesus. And it will continue to be evident today, tomorrow, the next day, as long as this world rejects Jesus as Lord. Amen. And even though judgment is deserved, God is still merciful and kind. Amen. And we've already seen more tragedies since Uvalde, Texas, and God will continue to be there. But as long as evil prevails, which is until Christ returns, more will unnecessarily die by violent acts of evil. Our text says that God cut short the days of the Roman siege over Jerusalem so some would survive. Now, wasn't that out of grace and mercy? Remember, God created us, friends, to enjoy a right relationship with him. That is the purpose for our existence, Amen. to enjoy a right relationship with him. But what happened? Man has rebelled against God and fell into sin. Yes. The world is cursed by sin. And what we see and what we experience in this broken, sinful world is sin just acting itself out through humanity. The ugliness of it all. We deserve God's judgment, wrath, and hell. We do. But because of God's love and mercy, he sent his one and only son, Jesus Christ, to save us from what we deserve. Jesus came to rescue us from ourselves by, by taking the punishment that I surely deserve and putting it upon himself. Yet people will continue to rebel against God and reject his grace and his mercy through his son, Jesus. God's judgment upon sin will eventually fall. And those who choose to reject Christ choose to perish. Amen. They choose to be separated forever from him in the lake of fire. Now, thankfully, in God's love for us, he, he extends his mercy, not just his judgment. Christ died on a cross to pay our sin debt against God in order to free us from the bondage and the punishment of our sin. He defeated death so that when he resurrected to life again, so that he can promise us eternal life if we would just trust him to save us. He called upon us to repent of our sin, to reject our sin and, and instead turn to him. And in humility, which is hard for humans, I know, in humility, surrender to his lordship and he will forgive us, he will redeem us, and he will give us the life he designed us for. Is there really no love and, and grace in God? Oh, yes, there is. 
And while Jesus' words could be taken as, again, referring to A.D. 70 Roman siege, to the destruction of, of Jerusalem, they are so emphatic and, and even clear that they must point ultimately to the final period of, of tribulation at the end of age because, as, as he stated, nothing like it would ever have been seen or would have ever be seen again. And in other words, what was described, folks, as the horror of tribulation that the Jews experienced who died at the hands of the Romans will not compare to how people will perish at the end of time. It will be far, far worse. Some interpreters include, conclude that Jesus talking about the end times was, was telescoping the near future and the, and the far future events as the Old Testament uh, prophets had done. Now last week we, I used an illustration. We talked about using the horizon of a mountain range to be able to try to comprehend the, the timelines, events of the whole picture as it was revealed to the prophet as they proclaimed God's word. Um, many of these persecutions of, of believers had already occurred and yet more are yet to come. In fact, they exist still today. And while a certain amount of persecution happened during the destruction of Jerusalem, uh, Jesus also envisioned a persecution of believers all throughout history. The persecution would be so severe, so severe that if the Lord had not cut short the days, if it had not had a specific ending time out of his grace, no one would survive. There, here it refers to a physical survival those who are born again have the guarantee of spiritual survival. And the time would be cut short for the sake of the elect, for God's grace, for his chosen people. The shortening of time would limit their duration uh, so that the destruction won't wipe out God's people and thus their kingdom mission. God is ultimately in charge over all of history and he won't allow evil to exceed the bounds that he has set. Jesus knew that he'd suffer the cross for himself. And here he knows of the persecution, the death and the resurrection for his followers. In verse 21, and then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ. Look, there he is. Do not believe it, Jesus says. For false Christ and false prophets will arise and perform signs and wonders to lead astray, if possible, the elect. In times of persecution, and I think we'll see it more and more each day, even strong believers will find it difficult to remain faithful. They'll so much want the Messiah to come that they will grasp at any hope that he's finally arrived. Jesus explained that his return will be unmistakable. Unmistakable to be able to keep us from being deceived by false messiahs. No one will doubt when he's here. And if we have to be told that the Messiah has come, he hasn't come. Christ's coming will be obvious to everyone. But friend, be on your guard. Jesus has told you all things beforehand. Let us pray. Fathers, we receive this word from you through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit given to human hands to write down on paper. It is indeed your love letter to us. 
It is a life that, I mean, it is a word that changes our lives. From lostness to salvation. From salvation to the maturity of a believer who sees your activity around us so that we may join you in it. I pray that if uh, someone did not have the assurance today that at their death that they would be in the loving arms of the Savior, but perhaps even doubt or question that it would be an environment of torment, darkness, and heat. To surrender themselves push aside the pride that binds us so deeply to sin. Surrender to your Lordship. Cry out, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner in desperate need of a Savior. Please have mercy on me. I confess my sin to you. I ask you, Lord, please forgive me. Make me whole. Make me clean. Make me yours. I believe that you died for me on a cross. You paid my sin debt so that I wouldn't have to. You defeated death, the devil, and sin so that I might have eternal life. I trust you, Lord Jesus. Come into my life. Be not only Savior, but be Lord. I commit my life to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Church family, we have a, a business meeting following our church uh, service today, but there's no time to waste if you need to make a decision about your future. Not your future tomorrow, but for all that God has planned for you. Let me spend some time with you. Let me not allow you to go to bed tonight without knowing that at any time you took your last breath and, and your heart beat its last beat, that you are in the loving hands of a God that loves you so much. I'm tempted just to sit and listen to Tomlin for a little bit. Uh, we did that as a teaser. When Steve and Margie get back, you tell them how much you missed them. Anyway, uh, let me, uh, first of all, I love bragging on people. I love bragging on Jesus, but I love bragging on people. Now, I had a uh, Discover class yesterday, so I didn't get out in and around uh, campus. I saw some activity. If you were here for Church Appreciation Day, I thank you so much. The place looks 100% better. The, yes, thank you. Give them a hand. The work that you did shows it, well, you know, we call, some people call it work day. No, I call it appreciation day. It's because you appreciate God's house that you take good care of it. Thank you for uh, your time and, and I bet you some sweat went into it as, as, as well. We'll remind you that we have a quarterly business immediately after, and I don't know if we have a whole lot of business, but we do want to bring somebody into the family formally by our uh, bylaws. And so if you are a voting member, now everybody is, uh, is welcome to stay. If you're not a member, you, have, you don't have a voice or, or anything of that nature. But sometimes people say, well, if I'm ever going to think about joining a church, I want to see how they do a business meeting. Well, uh, it'll be short and sweet, but, but uh, if, if you want to hang out, but uh, voting members uh, so that we can conduct that business. And um, at, I've mentioned this uh, several times in the past, and I just as a friendly reminder, at the Connection Center, we have a couple different things regarding if you happen to be in a community and you see houses going up or people moving in, that type of thing. At the Connection Center, there's this form right here that uh, it's called a welcome neighbor watch list. Uh, in my community, there's a lot of houses going up. We are targeting a community across the street called Fairways. It's right there at the Twisted Oaks Golf Community. And when people move in, uh, we've got some very talented people that are putting some kind of like welcome uh, baskets together that have 
gift certificates to businesses, like my favorite breakfast restaurant, Breakfast Station, um, some others around town, some information about our church, just some really cool uh, gifts. So uh, this orange card is here also. So uh, grab those, stop by the Connection Center and grab those. Um, part of this, uh, this idea also got birth out of remembering that when uh, Judy and I built a house over towards the villages many years ago, somebody came and gave us a stone with our name painted on it. So part of that is, is stones that are being painted, you know, like God bless his home and things like that too. So it, it, it is kind of a heartwarming. Last week, we started to bring attention to a petition that's going on, and it's still at the uh, Connection Center, and it is... Uh, uh, for adopting legislation that brings a sanctuary of the unborn to Citrus County. There's more information there, but if you want to support uh, that effort to protect the unborn, uh, that would be uh, helpful. And one last note. If you aren't carrying these guys around... Part of being prepared is being prepared to invite somebody to church. I love it when I'm out places and God opens up a conversation that leads to, uh, where do you go to church? And you'd be surprised how that happens. And so I want to be able to have these to say, would you be my guest? Here's an invitation card. Um, now, it does say 9 o'clock, and we're not back to 9 o'clock speed yet, so just 1045. Make sure they know about it or cross it out. But in the offering plate in the middle of the aisle, grab a few, stick them in your uh, wallet, pocketbook, or however you'll be prepared, and take those with you. Start those conversations, and uh, I'm just finding a little bit more hungriness to either start church or return to church. You know, you may, let me just say this, and I'll stop preaching. You may uh, say, I'm going to invite my next door neighbor, and immediately you get rejected. I'm still praying for my neighbor because he keeps rejecting me. But I get remarkable results in doctor's offices. <laughs> you know, sometimes uh, as much as I can, I wear my first Baptist shirt. I wear the uh, bracelet, uh, the um, open doors bracelet, something that might create that conversation and go intentionally to meet somebody that God has a divine appointment with you about. And I mean, I pray for it. That, that's how it happens for me. Lord, give me someone today and give me the spiritual antennas to, to pick up on it. And he gives it to me. It's a piece of cake. It really is. Um, so if you say being told no is persecution, you don't know persecution. Anyway, so with that, uh, let me greet y'all as quickly as I can at the front door when y'all leave. If you're going to stay, stay for the business meeting. We'll get it over uh, quickly. Brother Norman, would you please pray us out? And then we've got a doxology. Please stand for the benediction. And friends, if you don't have a relationship with Jesus, you need to get it done. Get her done. <laughs> Just today, I heard news of a cousin of mine in Jamaica that passed away. 50 years old, young. 50 years old. Died in his sleep. So if you don't have a relationship with God, you, know, you need to get it done. Father God, we thank you for the message that we've heard today. And we ask, Lord, that as we leave this place, we not leave your presence, that we take you with us everywhere we go. Tell people about you. Get them saved. Invite them to church. And uh, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. As we prepare for dismissal, I just would like to encourage you uh, by simply saying that worship is indeed one of those tools that God has given us to continue to prepare us and strengthen us as we are on our guard. Let the church say amen. amen.
Let the church say amen. Let the church say amen. God has spoken. Let the church say amen. Oh, come on now, say that with some conviction. Let the church say amen. So we believe it. Let the church say amen. And now receive it. God has spoken. Let the church say amen. Amen. Amen, Amen, church. Amen.